Now, I'm equally happy and pleased to be with you again um, in YP. And even although we are virtual, to see that um, you have a good vibe going and YP remains relevant and interesting for everyone who is young at heart. So thank you for bearing with me um, another week. And I trust that um, our fellowship this evening will really bear some fruit and have some impact on your lives as children of God. Now, um, I was asked if I could allow persons to ask questions during my presentation rather than waiting until the end, as some people may um, forget their questions. So um, I'm going to allow that, but I'm going to probably ask Brother Timothy to allow persons um, who will raise their hand if you, if you have a, a question or need a clarification on anything that um, I may say um, during the course of my presentation. With that said, um, I hope you have your Bibles as we be reading a few scriptures as we, as we go along. Okay, so with that, let's dive into it. Last week, um, we spent some time talking about the end time. And one of the things that came out quite clear um, about end time signs is the fact that end time signs are really events that will take place and those events, they are to highlight or signal us to be prepared because the coming of the Lord is near. Too often we said that persons are caught up with the events of the day, the current events of the day. We should know them, we should watch them, but Jesus said in St. Matthew 24 that we should not be troubled because these things must come to pass. It doesn't matter how much prayer meetings you have or how much you fast, these things must come to pass. And so while Jesus could not tell us the date or the hour, the year, the month, the week in which he was coming, as some people today are trying to do. Jesus could not do that because he said that information is reserved with the Father. So while Jesus could not give us the specific date, what he has done, he has given us the signs. And these signs are, as I said, events that will take place that will... Um, uh, signal us to prepare ourselves because his coming is near. So we discussed um, some of those signs, and I trust by now that um, we are taking a little bit better, uh, paying a little more attention to what's happening around us, and the 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 uh, important thing, the most important thing, is. When Jesus says prepare, when you prepare, you prepare for something that's coming, right? No one does preparation for nothing. You are expecting something to happen, so you prepare. And that event that is coming is the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So having spoken about the signs, which are events, we should be now in preparation mode. But preparing ourselves for what? That is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an event that no true child of God 
wants to miss. If you missed the second, second coming of Jesus Christ, you would have missed it all. And you will be in serious, very serious spot. Because you will now have to face what is to come thereafter. So tonight, um, we will be looking at the second coming and what happens after the second coming. Okay, uh, the second coming, and there are two events that will run simultaneously after Jesus Christ returns. But well, we'll get into it. I'd love for you to read to you from the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 10, 10 and 11. <clears throat> the second coming. Here it says, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, that is Jesus. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go up into heaven. This same Jesus shall come in like manner. Now, here, as Jesus was leaving earth, the disciples on the Mount of Olives saw Jesus ascending. And they looked and they gazed right until he went out of sight. And here, the two angels, we believe, was reminding them that Jesus Christ would return. Now, I may have mentioned that there are three eternal I wills that Jesus declared. The first one is in Matthew 16, 18, when he says, I will build my church. That has been fulfilled. The second eternal I will is found in St. John 16, I believe, where it says, I will send you another comforter. That has been fulfilled. And there is yet one more I will of Jesus that is yet to be fulfilled. And it is found in St. John chapter 14, where it says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. So these are Jesus's own pledges. I will come again and whether we believe it or not whether we prepare ourselves for it or not it doesn't matter what we do nothing can stop prevent or derail the fact of jesus's return to earth he's coming again and so jesus through different means. And right throughout the gospel, we record in Luke chapter 21, verse 27, Mark 13, verse 20, Matthew 24, 30. You can just make a note of those um, scriptures. You can look them up later. Where Jesus declared that he's coming. He's coming back. We see we're in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13, the, story, the parable of the ten virgins. Here again, Jesus was given a parable signifying the fact that he will return. So it is now clear in our minds, or we should be now at the point where we are fully convinced that Jesus Christ is coming again. It's an event that every child of God should and must look forward to. And the secret of it all, as we have said last evening, is preparation. Preparation. 
Now, the scripture not only tells us that Jesus Christ would return, but it also tells us a few things about his return. And this is what we want to talk about tonight. Not only is he coming, but there are some things that will happen or take place on his return. Now, I may have said this before, but let me repeat that the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is not a single event, but is rather a process. It's not a one-time um, event that does take place and done. It is actually a process because the return of Jesus Christ would be or will be in two phases. It will be in two phases. In the first phase, he is coming to the air and he's coming for the church. And we're going to talk about that tonight. In the second phase of his coming, he is coming with the saints and he's coming back to earth. And this is where Acts 11, so, sorry, Acts chapter 1, verse 11 tells us just as how he ascended from the Mount of Olives, he's going to descend on the Mount of Olives in the second phase of his coming. Now, between the first phase of his coming and the second phase of his coming, there will be a seven year period. There will be a, a time, a period of seven years. And during that seven year period, two remarkable events will take place. I'll be talking about one of them tonight. During that seven year period, um, we will have the marriage supper of the lamb and also the tribulation of which the second half of the tribulation is referred to as the great tribulation. So let's put this in perspective. His coming is in two phases. The first phase is coming for the saints and he's coming to the air. And that is referred to as a rapture, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Then after he comes to the air for the church in the rapture. A period of seven years will pass. During that seven year period, there will be tribulation on earth and in heaven will be the marriage supper of the lamb. At the end of that seven year period, Jesus will return in the second phase with his saints, 10,000 of his saints. And this time he's going to come on earth where a number of events will also take place, but most prominent among it is the setup is millennial reign. That means he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years. Okay. But further down, we'll, we won't get to that tonight. We won't have time, but We'll be talking tonight about second coming and the marks up of the lamb that will take place during that seven year period. So it's a process. So one of there are some prominent things that is spoken of here in, in Acts 1 11 that we must take note of. One is that and this referred is in Acts 1 11 now is making reference to the second phase of his coming when he's actually coming back on earth. Okay. Is when he comes in the second phase, it will be a physical bodily return. Jesus is going to return in person. Now, 
right there in Acts 1, 11, he ascended with a physical body. So he will also return with a physical body. The two men said, this same Jesus in light manner, the same way you see him go up, the same way he's coming down. So he's returning in with a physical body, visible physical body. Now, I want to point out something here that is important for us to realize about the, the second phase of his return. We must remember that the incarnation of Christ wasn't a temporary thing. It's a permanent thing. By incarnation, we simply mean God becoming man. God being clothed in human form incarnate now the incarnation of christ is a permanent thing christ is still incarnate even although he's in heaven he is still a man up in the glory interceding now for us so this man christ jesus is coming back to earth physically, visibly. The scripture tells us when he comes in the second phase that all eyes shall behold him. So, so when he ascended from the Mount of Olives, he did not lose his human nature or body. So he must return with that human body. Okay? So Christ will return to earth physically in the second phase of his coming. Another interesting thing that we see here in Acts 1.11 is that his return is what we call eminent. And the word eminent means something that is about to happen. So the return of Christ is something that is about to to happen it doesn't matter how much years now people talking about they hearing about it it is about to happen it's going to be happening we don't know we do not know when he shall return but we are warned that his return will be unexpected now this is making reference to the first phase of his coming, right? The first phase of his coming in the rapture. The rapture will be a sudden, unexpected event, right? But it is about to happen. Right, right, Peter. In 2 Peter 3 verse 10, said that he shall come as a thief in the night. And Paul to the Thessalonian saints in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2 also said, he shall come as a thief in the night. Now, the thing about the thief here in the night is the sudden unexpectedness. And this is what I, I want us to, to understand where the rapture is concerned. It's going to be sudden and it's going to be unexpected. But as I, I, I said, um, I think last week, that for those who look for him, the scripture says, shall he appear without sin unto salvation. So there has to be amongst us as believers two important things. We must be preparing and we must live in a state of expectancy. If you are expecting somebody to pick you up, but you're not sure what time they're coming. 
the best thing for you do is to get ready and sit down and wait because you're expecting to be picked up at any time. And so it is as Christians, when we look and see the signs of the time, telling us to be prepared, we should not only prepare ourselves and be ready, but we must live in a state of expectancy, looking for the imminent and sudden return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians should always be expecting Christ's return. You know, um, Paul to the Philippian saints in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, I believe, he says, who shall change our vile, verse 20 rather, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior. So as Christians, we must be looking for the Savior. Right? Not looking to see if that volcano is going to erupt or if that earthquake is going to shake our house. These are the signs. But look for Jesus' sudden and unexpected return. So, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and bring it up really quick here, and verse 10, last verse, he says, Paul says here, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And wait for his son from heaven. That's another interesting thing. Jesus ascending up to heaven, he's coming from heaven. And we, we wait for him coming from heaven. So the scripture does not speak of Christians waiting for signs. But rather, at all times, expecting his return. That is what we ought to be doing. Not just looking for signs, but expecting his sudden and imminent return. So in order to have a real present expectancy of Christ return that return must be possible at any moment let me go again if we are we, we expect a real you know a real expectancy we have a real expectancy of Christ's return that return must be something that is unexpected because if you know that he's coming, what do you have to expect, really? There are sometimes some things we see happen. I, I, said, to, I said to yourself, I'm not surprised. I expected it. Well, we won't be able to say that when Jesus returns. And that is why we have to live in a state of expectancy because he might come anytime. Now, James 5, verse 8, James 5, 8 tells us that the coming of our Lord is at hand. And what it means here, when something is at hand, it means it's not far away. Right? James 5, 8 is not far away. And then Jesus himself said, in Revelation 22 and verse 20. Surely I come quickly. So Jesus says he's coming quick. So what have we learned so far? In the first phase of his coming, it will be for those who are looking for him. It will be sudden. 
it will be unexpected. He's coming to the air. He's coming for those who are expecting him and looking for his return. Very, very important. Despite all that is happening, we have to be looking for his return. Then Christ is coming for the saints. As I said, he will not come to the earth. You know, first Thessalonians 4 tells us that he will come to the air. So while Jesus said in John 14, verse 3, that he is coming to get his people, right? In John 14, that famous chapter that we love to read, he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So Christ will return for his saints. The reason why he's coming in the first phase is to come for the saints. It's like a parent know that there's danger somewhere. Danger is lurking. Or hear that there's a trick at school. And immediately, they leave work and go and pick up their children. Because they don't want to expose them to that which is to come. Well, Jesus is, is gone to prepare a place for us. But he's coming for us. Because he doesn't want us to be around for what is to come. He doesn't want us to be around for the Antichrist. He doesn't want us to, us to be around for the beast or the mark of the beast or any of these things that will happen. So he's coming in the first phase for the saints. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there he may be also. So in the first phase of his coming, he's coming for the saints to take them back to heaven with him. And we want to see what is going to happen um, there and then. So let me quickly just read um, First Thessalonians, because here the Apostle Paul got a great revelation. You can read the first, well, the entire chapter, but let us read verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. A very interesting thing I want to point out to us. Verse 16, I just told you that not everybody is going to hear when Jesus comes in the first phase. It is only those who are looking for him. But here it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Now, Jesus shouting the voice of archangel and the trump of God. One would think, say, boy, maybe if you're sleeping, are you dead? You'll hear. But well, guess what? With all that shouting, with all the voice of the archangel, and all that is going on, guess what? Only those that look for him shall hear him. Very interesting there. Just want to point that out to you. So the Lord will come down from heaven. He's not coming out from the Middle East. He's not coming from out of Germany or Japan or China. Or he's not even coming from Mars. He's coming from heaven. Right? That's the first thing. The next thing is that his people, both the living and the dead. That, that's the dead who will be raised to life. Will be gathered to meet him in the air 
So it doesn't matter whether you live or die. As long as you have a personal relationship with Jesus, even if you die and your body goes to the ground, when Jesus returns to the air for the saints, the scripture tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise first and those who are alive and remain. Not those who are alive and sell out their salvation. Not those who are alive and not living for Jesus Christ. Those who are alive and remain intact will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then it tells us that they will then always remain with him. When Jesus comes for the saints, there will be no parting again. There will be no parting. He will not leave us. Now, well, right now he's not leaving us nor forsaking us. Right? He's gone to prepare a place. But when he comes for us, we will, the scripture says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The last clause of verse 17 in 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So there's no parting after that. I want to, I want to sensitize us, brothers and sisters, to the importance of being a part of the rapture. Being a part of the rapture is so important. It is so necessary. And Jesus Christ is doing everything to ensure that we are part of that process. He's coming down from, he from heaven. He's coming himself. He's not sending Michael. He's not sending Gabriel. He's not sending any of these archangels. He's coming himself to the ear for you and I. And then he's going to change us whether we're living or we're dead, and we shall be with him together, never to part company again throughout the countless ages of eternity. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is the high point of our salvation. This is what we look forward to. This is what we must serve God for. This is what we must forsake the world. This is what we must turn our back to sin for. This is what we, we should look up to. In this day and age of abounding iniquity, when things are so rampant and loose, this is something that we must look forward to. And we must be a part of this event. So Paul to the Thessalonians says, talks about the dead in Christ. And the Thessalonian saints at the time they were a bit confused about what happened to the persons who died in the Lord. What will happen to them? Maybe they were thinking that, sure, oh, once them dead, them dead and it's over with. And that's the end of the story. But Paul, by revelation of the Lord, brought clarity to exactly what will happen to the person who dies in the Lord. He gave clarity as to what would happen to my mother. He gave clarity to what would happen to your mother. Your loved one who left a testimony that they served God while they were alive. It's not the end. Death is just a stepping stone. But once you die in Christ, you are safe. Nothing can prevent you from going with the Lord when he comes. So in verse 16, he talks about the dead in Christ shall rise. All believers who died before Christ returns will be resurrected and caught up in the rapture. All believers who died before the return of Jesus Christ. They will be, their bodies will be resurrected, gloriously transformed, and they will be caught up 
to meet the Lord in the air with the living, caught up with the living believers to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the doctrine of the bodily resurrection of the dead is of great importance to the Christian faith. And I sh I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate by now why it is so important. Can you imagine if we serve the Lord faithfully and we die and there was no hope for us? What if it were that is only people who are alive that Jesus would come for? What would happen to those who die in the Lord? And so it is important the, the doctrine of the bodily resurrection of believers is one of the the, 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 the corner post of the Christian faith. Because with that, as Christians, we can live in hope. We can die in hope. Praise the Lord. Yes, we can die in hope. It doesn't matter if you die in a plane crash or you die in a car crash or you drown or you are shot by a bullet. It doesn't matter how you die. As long as you die in Christ, there is hope you will receive a bodily resurrection. It's important. The separation of the soul and the body at death is only temporary. So when a person physically die and the soul is, is, is separated from the body, the body goes back to the earth from whence it came. And there's a separation between soul and body. It is just a temporary situation until the resurrection when Jesus shall return. Because when Jesus shall return in the resurrection, your soul will be united with your body. Praise the name of Jesus. Paul speaks about it in Romans 8, verse 23 to 24. The, the redemption of the body is the hope of the resurrection of the dead, which is part of the future experience of our salvation. Because something, something, something spectacular is going to happen, whether we, we are living or we were dead. Something spectacular is going to happen when Jesus returns for us in the rapture. And that is the final part of our redemption. The our, 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 our salvation package is consistent of three main parts. Justification, that comes when we are saved, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And once you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are being justified. You are standing before God as if you have never sinned. Because Jesus canceled all your sins. The second part of our salvation is sanctification. And that is an ongoing process that's happening now because it is preparing us. So we are now being sanctified by the Spirit and by the Word. But the final part of our salvation is the glorification of our mortal bodies. And that, believers, will take place when Jesus returns for us in the rapture. Bless his wonderful name. And so the redemption of the body is the hope of the resurrection of the dead, which is part of the future experience of our salvation. The bodies with which the souls of the dead in Christ will be reunited at the resurrection. These are the same bodies which were laid in the grave. The same body that you bury your loved one with or anybody buried in Christ is the same body that is going to be raised. Jesus Christ is the first fruit. Jesus was the example, right? 
Jesus, um, in um, he said, well, actually in, in John, when they were gathered together, you remember that scenario, when we had doubtful Thomas, and Thomas said, listen, I don't believe in him, but then the Lord raised from the dead. No, sir. Fairy tale. And that's the story. And Jesus appeared to them. And he looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, come here, Thomas. See the nail prints in my hand. Thomas, feel my side. See the sword mark in my side. And this immediately gives credence to the fact that it's the same body that Jesus was buried with is the same body that was resurrected, but only with a major difference in that it was a glorified body. It was an incorruptible body. It was an immortal body. It was a body that now did not depend upon the blood for sustenance. And hallelujah. The believer's resurrection body shall be like Christ. It's going to be a glorious body. A supernatural body that is not limited by time nor space. Nor the dimension of time. In Philippians 3 and verse 21, Paul to the Philippians said that our bodies will be transformed Christ will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So there will be a transformation of the body at the rapture when the dead in Christ shall rise and those that are alive are mean shall be caught up. And Paul said, we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkle of eye. And, and that's why the writer to in first John chapter 3, he says, Behold, what love, the what man of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And he went on and he said, When we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall know him, and we shall see him, and not another. Bless his wonderful name. So that's one of the glorious things that you don't want to miss again. That's why you can't miss the rapture. Because that is transformation time. You've gone through two thirds of your salvation right now. You're justified and you're sanctified. But if you miss the glorification part, you miss out on it. And the only time to receive a glorious body is in the rapture. So when Jesus rose from the dead, when he rose from the dead, he demonstrated clearly that it was the same body which he had been crucified and buried with. Same body. His resurrected body was still a body of flesh and bones. In Matthew, in, in St. Luke 24, 39, it gave reference to that. I remember also that Jesus was able to, after his resurrection, he was able to, one day he was on the seaside and he was there boiling fish and he was there eating fish with them. And he said to them, no man, let me paraphrase it. This is not no ghost because a spirit don't have flesh and bones. See me? Real. Right? The same body. His resurrected body is still a body of flesh and bones. So, like Christ, the believer's resurrected body will be one of flesh and bones. No blood. But in another way, this resurrected body will be different from that which was laid in the grave. Jesus Christ's resurrected, resurrected body was. It will be a transformed body, a glorified body. Christ will transform our bodies, 
or lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So what is going to happen? So a change will take place in the believer's body at the resurrection. Like Christ's resurrected body, the believer's resurrected body will be perfected. Hallelujah. It will be a perfect body. It will be an incorruptible body. It will be an immortal body. Bless his wonderful name. This change the Bible speaks of as our glorification. And in, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we often love to read these scriptures at funeral services. But in verse 52, Paul said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on Im immortality. So that's a guaranteed change that will take place at the rapture. You don't want to miss it. Glorified bodies. No sickness, no disease, nothing at all. Perfect. So Paul also said, made not only talk about the dead in Christ, but he talked about those who are alive and remain. Now, not all Christians will die before Christ return. Right? Jesus in Matthew said that there's a generation that will not die before the Lord returns. So in the time that he's coming, that generation won't die out before he returns. So there will be living Christians at his return. We don't know. Maybe we are the living Christians. We don't know. Right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 55, living Christians will be glorified. Their bodies will be transformed even though they didn't die. Those, so there, there's no difference in what happened to those who died and those who are alive. So when Paul says those who die shall not prevent us, the same thing that happened to those who die in Christ is the same thing that's going to happen to those who are found living in Christ at his return. Those who are alive at his return will also receive a change, and which is a glorified body. So this is what will take place when Jesus comes. And again, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss all that because what is going to come after? You're going to want to be with it. And there's another thing that you, you don't want to be a part of at all. So prepare and live in expectancy. So the rapture take place. Let's look where we're coming from. End time things going on right now, signaling that the coming of Christ is near. Then, bam, the rapture, Christ returns. He comes for the saints, gone with them to heaven. What happens next? What happens next, believers? Will that be the end? No, no, no. That is just the start of what is to come. There are two activities that will run consecutively, one in heaven and the other on earth, and these will run for a period of seven years. So right after the church is raptured, caught up, gone to heaven, it will mark the beginning of a seven year period in which something spectacular will happen in heaven and something terrible will be happening on earth. 
I'm going to, I won't tonight talk about what will happen on earth, but let me talk about what will happen in heaven. What will happen in heaven is the marriage supper of the lamb. And what will happen on earth is the tribulation of which the second part of it is described as the great tribulation. You know, on their own for that. So while there is bliss and joy in heaven, it will be like hell on earth. Like it. Right? And these activities will take place for a period of seven years. The marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to spend some time and talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And for this, I'd like to read for you from Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 to 10. And here, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos had a revelation. And he said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So. While. Right out of the rapture. Jesus come and he catches the saints, take them to heaven, gone for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, in order for us to understand the concept of the marriage supper, it is better understood when we look at the wedding customs at the time when Jesus lived on earth. The wedding custom when Jesus was on earth is very much different from today. Very much different. And so to understand about the marriage supper of the Lamb, we need to look at the what was the custom at the time when Jesus walked on earth, how marriages went. Now, marriages at the time of Jesus, they had three major parts. There's a three parts to, 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 to a wedding or a marriage. Three parts to a marriage. The first part is that a marriage contract is signed between the parents of the bride and the groom. Right? A contract. I believe in many Oriental countries, same thing going on. You don't decide who you get married to. Is, is a parents decide who you get married to? And sometimes parents marry children from all five year old. <laughs> but that was the custom of the time. So a contract is signed between both parents, that of the bride and the groom, and the parents of the bridegroom or the bridegroom himself would pay what is called a dowry. Do, a dowry, a do, a yes. A dowry is like a down payment. And he will pay that down payment on behalf of the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the bride's parents or to the bride herself, right? 
the bridegroom will pay over that down payment either to the bride parents or the bride, or bride herself. Now, once that contract is signed, this will start what we call the betrothal period. Betrothal is what we call engagement. Right? So first, parents come and they sign a contract. The bridegroom, he make a down payment and the engagement start. Now, this was what, what happened to Mary and Joseph back there in Matthew 1, 18 or Luke 2, verse 5. The scripture says that Joseph was exposed to Mary. Right? An exposal speaks of, of a, a, an adoption or a support. And because Joseph was now engaged to Mary, and to find out that she was with child, that was a very, very, very unfortunate thing. And that's why the scripture says that he desired not to make a public embarrassment of her. He was planning to put her away privately. But the angel of the Lord came to him and said, fear not to take Mary as your wife. This thing is of God. So that marks the first phase of a marriage. The second phase of the marriage, it usually occur maybe like a year after. Right, so there were several months up to a year of engagement or betrothal. Now, the second part is when the bridegroom, you know, accompanies, is accompanied by his male friends. Right? And they would go to the house of the bride at midnight. You know, with torch and parading through the street, and I watch a I watch a, a Jewish wedding recently, and I saw it literally. The bridegroom, along with his male friends, they will light some torch, and they'll walk to the home of the bride, and they will sing, and go to the home of the bride. Right, they walk through the street. Now, the bride would know in advance, she would know in advance that this was going to happen or this was going to take place. And so she will be ready for it. She will be ready with her maidens. And when the bridegroom gets here, she and her ladies would join the parade and they will end up at the home of the bridegroom. So the second phase again, the bridegroom along with his male friends will march in a parade through the streets to the home of the bride. She would know that he's coming. So she will get herself ready. She know that he's coming. When he gets there, she joined the parade and they marched back to the home of the bridegroom. Now, Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, gave us a parable of the ten virgins. And that was what Jesus was talking about in the parable of the ten virgins. Right? All ten virgins were there waiting for the bridegroom to come at midnight. But well, guess what? Five have oil in the lamps, five didn't. And Jesus was saying, listen, the bridegroom is coming. Trim your lamps. Make sure your lamp is ready because at midnight, the bridegroom is coming. But if your lamp is found without oil, then you will be left behind. So that's the second phase of the, of, the, of the marriage. 
The third phase of the marriage is the marriage supper itself. We have now the, the actual marriage supper, the banquet, what we call reception, the banquet. And this marriage supper is something that may go on for days. As in the example of Jesus when he appeared at the wedding at Canaan in John 2, 1 to 2. And after a couple of days, they ran out of wine. An embarrassment to the bride and groom. But Mary, the, mo the mother of Jesus, knew that Jesus was there. Jesus was invited to that wedding. And so she called upon him and he performed his first miracle. So that would be the first phase. That would be the third phase of the, of the wedding or the marriage. So you have a contract. Then you have an engagement. Then you have the supper. Now, the first phase, which is a contract, is like the gospel. The gospel. The gospel is preached. And the dowry, the down payment that Jesus had to pay was the price of his own blood. Jesus made a down payment with his own blood to purchase us as his bride. Now, the church on earth is now going through the engagement period. Right? We are engaged to Christ as a church. Right? And the final part of that engagement is going to be the rapture. This is when now like in those wedding of those days when the bridegroom would go to the bride's home, get the bride, and take her back to his house. So it is that Jesus is going to leave heaven, come catch his bride, and take her back to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb. So while all that is going on, it will be a hell on earth situation. So here is the situation. So that explains, I hope you understand the, the, how uh, the Jewish wedding went at that time and how it fits in here with how Jesus Christ is dealing with the church. So the church will now be perfected. The rapture come. The final part of our redemption. We are perfected and we are in heaven. Right? So the church is now in heaven and the church is per perfected. Now, Jesus waited long for his perfect church. It's a long time Jesus waiting for his perfect church. He exposed himself to her before the earth was. But there was much to do before she could be ready as a bride. So Jesus signed up that contract for his bride before he even, before he even laid the foundation of the earth. What I want to point out to us believers is Jesus planned for this long time long before he laid the foundation of the earth, before he created any Adam. He signed that contract. So it's a long time he's waiting. He's waiting for his bride. And even though he was engaged, his bride was not, is not ready. So he's still in waiting. He, Jesus, the bridegroom, what he had to do, he had to leave his father's home and become one with his bride.
bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. I want to really see this in, 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 in the context of a marriage. Right? So Jesus, just like how Isaac um, or Isaac phone or, or a, a serv Isaac sent out his servant or the servant was sent out to seek a bride for Isaac. So Jesus left his ivory palace and came. He signed a contract with, with God. He became one with his, with his bride and he took on his bride's humanity. And for our sake, the church, the bride, he never quit, or rather, he quit. He quit his thrones, his crowns, his royalty of heaven, that he might be bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. I don't know about you men in the, in, 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 in the service tonight who are, who are married, when you are engaging or oh, you go all out to make sure you get your bride. Well, Jesus went all out. He left heaven. He come down. And if it was not enough to make his bride ready even though he was born here he lived here he died here he associated himself with his bride it was not enough to make his bride ready so now the holy ghost is making ready the bride right so the holy spirit is now making ready the bride and brothers and sisters, and this is what we read now in Revelation chapter 7, sorry, Revelation chapter 19, where John received revelation, the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his bride or his wife has made herself ready. She is complete. A long time is going on, and it finally happened. Brothers and sisters, this is a fulfillment of a long expectation. You men who got married, when you finally, the ceremony over, you now know all the time when the marriage is about to take place. The ceremony is about to take place. There's a sense of fulfillment all this engagement and courting and what have you going on all this time is finally done. My expectation is fulfilled. And here it is. His bride that is away from him will be with him. We shall be with him and we shall see him as he is. Right? So finally, after all this courting that started, the contract signed before Earth was formed. And we went through the process. Down payment make. And now the Holy Ghost is preparing the bride. Brothers and sisters, when the church would have been raptured, it is a clear sign that the bride is now perfected. She's now ready. She is indeed complete. The bride is complete. So the expectations of Christ will be fulfilled at the marriage supper of the Lamb. His expectation will be fulfilled. The scripture says that he shall see of the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I can see myself there. And I can see you there, brothers and sisters. 
I believe that the heart of Christ is longing for that day when he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That day will be the day of an open publication of the great fact of the mutual love and union. It will be an open publication. Picture a wedding. Ceremony finish. We're having the recessional. And here it is. That the bride and the groom, they are marching out. They are going out. They are going out in the reception. And, and that, that groom and bride, as they take each other's hand and they are walking out, they are publicly declaring their love and their union. This is now my wife. And it is declared. This is now my husband. And it's dear. There's joy in their hearts. There is fulfillment. There is a union that cannot be broken. So that day will be a day of open publication of the great fact of Christ's mutual love for his church. The time is going to come, my friend, in the second coming, the second phase of his coming, when he's coming back with the saints. Nobody knows no, no. the ungodly don't even business about Christ's love the church. They don't business. Right? Nobody don't business. But it's when Jesus come back with his saints, it will be a public declaration all eyes shall behold him and everybody's going to see him coming down the corridors right down the corridors with his bride right at his, at his side symbolizing his love and the union an unbrokenable union it will be a marriage without divorce it will be a marriage without the, the, in the very thought of any separation. It would be an overflowing of joy and delight. Can you imagine the man finally get the woman to marry? He's finally wife now. He's overjoyed. He, he, he would have seen all this time of preparation and, 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 and all everything over now. Finally get him bride. It will be a grand display of his magnificence. Because, you know, at a wedding, you know, who really gets, who they really look at? The bride. The bride is the center of attraction at the wedding. Yeah, they look at the groom. But guess what? The bride is a central point of focus. And read in Revelation that she shall be white, she shall be clean, she shall be sparkling, no spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing. The bride now would have been completed and be ready and be perfect. And Jesus is going to display to all and sundry, to principalities and powers throughout the countless ages of eternity. The fact of his magnificent bride that which will be shining. And that speaks of you and I, my friend. I want to close off before I take um, any questions with a very important point that I must challenge us on. The scripture in Revelation 19 asks a question. And I ask tonight, who are called to the supper? Who is called to the wedding? Because you know what a wedding, if you have a wedding with us bride and groom and minister, that's a little private thing. But if you have a real wedding, you're going to have relatives, you're going to have special guests and these people at the wedding, who is called? So the question is asked, 
who is calling to the wedding. I hasten to say right here and right now, based on where we are, everyone, every jack man on earth that is born as an opportunity to be a part of that bride. By way of the gospel, everyone. So while there is a blessedness in being called, because John said here, blessed are they who are called. While there is a blessedness to those who are called, there is also a curse. If called sinners refuse to come to the Savior. So even though everybody is called, guess what? And those who are called are blessed. You can be cursed if you reject the call, if you reject the gospel. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heaven laden, and I will give you rest. There's no other name on heaven given among men whereby we must, must be saved. Come ye that thirst, and I will give you water. That you shall never thirst again. And so the gospel. The gospel invitation. Is going out. In the. Of the feast. When those who were bid to come. Did not come. The master said listen man. Go out on the byways and edges. And call the lame. The alt. The blind. Anybody else just call them. Because those who were invited. Never come. Therefore, everyone is called, but it is only those who accept the gospel will stand a chance and will be blessed. So who really then, since everybody is called? I'd like to su suggest that those call and they accept the invitation, that is the gospel, they will be at the wedding. Two, those call that love the bridegroom. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there will be no enemies at the marriage of the Lamb. When people are when get him, when people get married, you think they look up and look up for the greatest enemy and invite them. Who invites them enemy at the wedding? Nobody does that. So guess what? Those who love the Lord. Those who are not enemies of his. They are called and they are blessed. Thirdly, I like to suggest that those that are called that have made themselves ready. Those who have made themselves ready. In another parable, Jesus spoke that there was a banquet that was going on. And when they look around, they see this man looking strangely dressed. And they ask, friend, where's the wedding, where's the, where's the banquet garment? Maybe he was dressed, hip shotted or dressed in riff rough clothes, but he wasn't, obviously wasn't dressed for the banquet. I know what they did. They put him out. They put him out of the wedding because he never have his wedding garment on. They never, like the five foolish virgins who lost out when the bridegroom came at midnight. They were not ready. And so they lost out. So those with our call and they are ready. Brothers and sisters, I can't emphasize the need for us, for me, for you. And the more I'm talking this, I am speaking to myself. We have to be ready. I will won't be part of this. Then, fourthly, I'd like to suggest those that love or have a desire to go. I don't know, sometimes if you, you hear, you hear like a friend is getting married 
Oh, my nice, my favorite co worker, or my brother, my sister. Oh, I would just love to go to that wedding. I would just love to go to that wedding. Boy, I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare my clothes to go to that wedding. I want to get my shoes ready. I'm going to get a new ear do. Those who desire to go, which speaks of those who are looking for Jesus Christ. Those who are looking are those who are desirous of going. Brothers and sisters, if you want to stay down here and sell out our soul for earthly riches, and big house and big car and women and 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 smoke and 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 drink and gamble and live it up in riotous living saying that we are young and we are enjoy life later for us but those of us who are desirous of going with him unto those that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation if we're not looking for him, we won't be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, there will be the church, which is a bride. There are those who will be there like guests. The guests would include those who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be in the church. You go to heaven just the same, but you are going to be like a guest at the wedding. Now, this wedding was originally slated for the Jews. But the Jews fool themselves. And so Jesus bring in the Gentiles. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. To the extent that as Gentiles, outcasts, dogs, and sorcerers, we can be now part of the bride. So the body of Christ is neither true nor Greek, is neither bond nor free. But we are all one in Christ Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles. We are part of the church. But those who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit will be like the guests. There might be the, the attendants will be like the patriarchs, Moses, Elijah, and all those who have gone before us. There will be like, I don't know if you call them groomsmen or what have you, the, the various made of honor, whatever, in the marriage will be. But the fact of the matter is that Gentiles, we Gentiles, will be a part of that which Jesus Christ is doing. Oh, bless his name. What a wonderful privilege we have. What a great opportunity. What a chance of a lifetime, believers. What is it that we will not give up for this? What is it that we will allow us will not allow us to gain this wonderful privilege. What is it that's going to come between us and our Lord? Is it food? Is it position? Is it fame? Is it fortune? Is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it your husband? Is it your wife? Is it your children? What is it that is going to separate you or cause you not to be a part of this? There is a blessedness and to, 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 to be called. There is a blessedness to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they that are called. Believers, let us remain the called. Let us be ready when Christ come. Because while the marriage supper of the Lamb is going on, we, are, we, we be like Jesus. We are part of the bride. We are radiant. We are standing out. We are the, the, the point of focus. 
We are the point of focus. Jesus, we are told, is going to gird himself and serve us. Not Pastor Allen. Not Pastor Lewis. No, Jesus Christ himself shall drink on you. Hallelujah. He will serve us while we are on earth. Now we do it in remembrance of him. But he himself will serve us and he shall drink anew with us in his father's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, this is the real moment. This is the real thing. Let us not miss out on it. I stop here for now and perhaps sometime in the future, We'll talk about, I'll pick up from here, and we'll talk about, well, all this nice thing going on in, in heaven, what is going on on earth? We'll talk about the tribulation. God bless you tonight, and I trust you have heard and you have learned something. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? Okay, good night again. Thank you so much, Pastor Allen. Thank you so much. And it's truly not about being concerned with the signs and, you know, if this is happening, but it's just to be in a constant state of readiness. Once yeah. we're ready, we need not worry about if this is going to happen or when or whatever, because we don't know. Sure. And the best thing we can do is to just remain in a state of, of yeah. readiness. So whenever yeah. the Lord is ready to put in his appearance, we are here ready and waiting, looking forward to it, excited because we know we are going to be with him. Hallelujah. And that should be our focus. So um, as Pastor Allen said, you know, does anyone have any questions? The floor is open. You can put your questions for it. At this time, you are able to un unmute your mics and, and ask whatever questions you may, you may have for, for Pastor. Good night, sir. Good night. Yes. Um, you made a hello. Yes, go ahead, Sister Dan. Um, you made a a, a a a point at the closing. I never get much at the beginning, but at the closing, when you say that um, the marriage supper of the Lamb, you give the explanations. And one of the thing you said, who will be at the supper? And you said, those who are called, those who get saved, those who love the Lord, make themselves ready or... My, my, my internet went down. To go. Could, you, could, you, could, you, could you please repeat? My, my internet went just a split second. Could you repeat? Oh, you, you, were, you, were, you said that who will be at the supper? Yes, yes, yes. And you said, those who are called, those who get saved, those mm. who love the Lord, make themselves ready mm. or love to have the desire to go. What well, the next thing is you said that um if you don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will not be a part of the wedding. No, um, you, okay, okay. Go ahead. And um next point is what I want to find out is so Moses and Elijah, where will they be? Okay, let me deal with the first part of your question. Yes, sir. Clarification here. It's not that you won't be a part of the wedding. Uh-huh. But you know, you know, even guests, the guests that you invite at the wedding, they are part of the wedding. Yes, sir. Be, they, they won't be a part of the bridal party. Okay. But they'll be at the wedding. Now, in order for you to be a part of the church, which is which is a bride of Christ, yeah. you will have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Holy Spirit is the guarantee. The Holy Spirit is a person who places you in the body of Christ. So if you if you if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll go, you'll go to the wedding just the same. When the Lord comes, you'll go. If you if you're saved tonight and the Lord comes tomorrow, are you, are you not filled? You'll go just the same. But when you are at wedding, you wouldn't be a part of the bridal party. You will start sitting in the pews as looking a guest <laughs> and looking on at the wedding that is taking place, right? So um, in order for you to be a part of the bride, you'll have to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
And this promise is unto us and unto our children's children and to as many as the Lord thy God shall call. I know much emphasis is not placed on that now, but yes. we need to really be emphasizing that and persons with, with, with understanding such as this need to begin to seek the Lord, to seek the Lord. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's good to, to be invited to a wedding, but it's better when you are part of it. Part of it, you know. <laughs> um, the, 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 the second part of your, your question, um, what was it again? Second I was part. asking Moses and Elijah. Oh, those yes, people, yes. Where will they be? Okay. What happened is that during that period, they will not be resurrected as yet. Till. But the spirit of these patriarchs will be there. Right? They, they, it, it's after the tribulation. We will see that. When, yes. When in, in, I think it's in Revelation 7, where, where it talks about there was a great, after they talk about the, the 144,000, which the Jehovah Witness claimed that is 144,000 going. The scripture tells us that there was a great innumerable amount of persons, countless amount of people. And it tells us that these are they that came out of great tribulation. Right. So the tribulation sins, right? So their, their bodies would have been resurrected after, right? After the marriage of the Lamb. So the spirit of Moses and Elijah and these patriarchs will be at the wedding. But they bodily would not be there because they would not have been resurrected at the time. Okay, so thank you. Okay. Good night, sir. Good night, everyone. Good night, sir. Sam. My question is, um, what are your thoughts? Are, are, or are there any um, evidence in the Bible that says um, pertaining to the um, the children? that who, who died, um, till birth, after birth, during the ages of one to 11, because I said 12 is um, the age of accountability, and also the adults and children with disabilities, because I noticed um, Father Holang and other place of um, safety for children with disabilities, they pray for them. And after they die, they pray for them also. So I want to know where, where, they, where, where is it that the Lord is lenient on them? They not they don't come to accountability to say yes, God, or they, 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 they God give them a chance before to repent during the, the time. I don't know. I'm just start a concern about those those um children. Mm -hmm. and, persons with disabilities here yeah. where would they come yeah. in yes yes All sir right. okay um i'm gonna be honest with you i i'm not prepared to fully answer that question tonight yes but what, what 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 um but i will i will i'll look it up and see uh in the scriptures what the scripture says about it but one thing i can tell you that in the white throne judgment when the wicked dead will be resurrected for judgment the scripture tells us in revelation where, where john says and i saw the dead both great and small stand before the judgment that's an indication that children would be wicked children, unrepentant, perhaps who have not reached the age of accountability, will stand before the white throne judgment. It's an indication. But when but where it relates to children with disabilities or those who have not, who can't account for themselves, I will have to research that one and see what the scripture says about that and um, get back to you. 
on that one, Sister Karen. All right, so I've made a note of it. I've written it down and I will um, definitely provide an answer on, on that one. Okay, so thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, going, going, gone. I think. Not yet, sir. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, sir. During the millennial reign, mm -hmm. where will where will us the church be? Because I, I ask the question because earlier you said that when Christ comes and, and, and gets us, that we'll never be separated from him again. And then you spoke about the millennial and reign and the fact that when he comes, he'll be coming with 10,000 of people. So is it that all of us will be coming back with him at that time? Absolutely. There you go. The second phase of his coming, he's coming back with, scripture said, 10,000 of his saints. Mm -hmm. And among the things that he's going to be doing, He's going to be um, destroying the armies that get up against Israel in the Armageddon War. And then he's going to establish his millennial reign. And we are, we are told by the scripture that the saints shall reign with him. He will be the king on the throne, but we will be like his administrators. Okay. Right? So we shall reign with him. So once we are joined with him in the rapture, there's no point in eternity that we'll ever be separated from him. No separation from them, from him. We are going to reign with him for the thousand years. And after the thousand years, we will be also judging with him in the right throne judgment. Right? That's why Paul was saying to some people who were giving some problem in the church. And he said, listen, don't you know you're going to be judging angels? Yeah, man, pull up on the socks and do better, man, because we're not going to be judging angels. You know? So um, there's a whole host of things, that activities that we will be um, involved in um, as a church. We will be like, like the, the cabinet of God's government during the, the throughout the countless ages of eternity. So we'll be fully occupied, we'll be fully engaged, and we shall be with him. Because scripture says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. No point of separation. So yes, we will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <coughs> okay, is there um, anyone else who has a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, Turn the volume, please. Uh, Pastor? Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Walter. Oh, Mr. Walter is... in being saved and not and not being filled they find themselves in heaven uh, repeat that why should some person i'm not interested in being filled with the spirit but they will be in heaven what will be the difference with them in heaven than those who are filled okay in heaven, well, first of all, there's no point in a person not wanting to receive what is the Holy Spirit. The church, as I said earlier, would be okay. All right, I was muted for a minute. Right, um, the church would be. God's cabinets that will carry out the duties 
of the administration throughout eternity. Persons that are not part of that cabinet would be just living, living saints who will um, enjoy the, what should I say, the bliss, the walk on Golden Street, drink milk and honey, and all the fanciful things that is to be found in heaven. But they, um, they won't be a part of the, of the governmental structure that God is going to set up to rule and reign for eternity. For you again, I will um, look into the scripture to see even more definitively what else they'll be doing. But I can safely say to, to you that they, would, they won't be a part of the governmental system. Perhaps they, they might have some, um, some form of responsibility on the per peripheral side. Um, if we, if, we come, if we do a comparison, you know, we have to compare things in earthly terms because this is what we understand. Um, they, they might not be the, the minister of a particular ministry. They may not be like the permanent secretary. They may not be the financial controller. But who knows, maybe they might be like a clerk. You know, a clerk in an office or a receptionist or, or something of the sort. Um, not having that hierarchy of, of, of um, authority or, or um, responsibility, right? They would not have that higher level of responsibility, such as um, members of the cabinet, right? So, um, but I will, I will also I'll make a note and, and, and see if the scripture tells us more about um, persons who make it in, but they are not part of the bridegroom, sorry, of the, of the bridal party. Um, but for our presentation tonight, I just highlighted the importance of being a part of the bride and how you can become a part of the bride. But I look into, I can look further into that, um, Brother Walters. Um, I know you're asking out of curiosity because nobody here wants to find themselves in that situation. All right, so anything else? Oh, yes, sir. Um, I was just thinking about the, um, the, is it the two angels who were, um, oh, I think I'm going ahead of myself. The two angels who were preaching the gospel, that was in like, the tribulation time, right, sir? During the great tribulation, uh, the scripture actors make reference to Two witnesses, right? Two witnesses. Um, not sure, but they could be angels. Um, but it's specifically demogod things here, right? Who devil type scene, right? It, it uh, make reference to two witnesses that will be preaching the kingdom message, and of course they will be killed. And that is during the second half of the Great Tribulation. All right, let me let me quickly say this. Um, the seven-year period. Um, so the first part is going to be nice. But the, the man of sin is going to come on the scene. He's going to sign a contract with Israel. Um, he's going to bring about some form of world peace. There will be a, a state of stability and peace going on. Um, temple worship will be restored. The temple shall be rebuilt in Jerusalem and they will continue to offer up sacrifices like they did in the old economy. 
and all of that will go on, go on, go on for three, three and a half years. But at the middle of that seven year period, the man of sin is going to um, change his color like a, you know, like a, green, a green lizard. Um, he's going to break the contract, he's going to break his vow, and he's going to begin to show his true colors. And the temple will be destroyed, and he's going to go all out, um, set up himself as God, and for people to worship him. And he's going to set up the beast, and not only beast, but the mark of the beast, wherein one can buy or sell without the mark. And he's going to do all sorts of atrocities if um, during the time when the, when the, when the gospel is being preached in that time if you accept the gospel of Jesus Christ you will be killed because this man of sin is not going to have nobody talking about Jesus and not serving him he's either you'll be serving him or you die so once you stand up for Jesus you're going to be killed but guess what a lot of people are going to be glad and happy to do it you know why because they missed the rapture because they didn't listen to their mother. They didn't listen to their father. They never listened to the deaconess. They never listened to the pastor. They never listened to the preacher. They never listened to anybody at all when the gospel was being preached. And so they find themselves now left behind. And the only way they can get into heaven and have eternal life is to accept Jesus Christ and face death. Because this man of sin is not going to allow them to live he's not going to have nobody up, up against him so once you name the name of jesus you will be killed and this is why there will be an innumerable amount of persons coming out um that is described as tribulation saints right because they got saved during the tribulation the Jews will be preaching the message do that during that time. And um, these two particular witnesses uh, will appear on the scene and they eventually will be killed. But we get more into that if and when we get to the talk about the tribulation. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Man, you need to talk now? Yes, um, Pastor. Yes, it's the Lovetta. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that Moses and Elijah, that their spirits only will be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes. And that their bodies would be resurrected after the tribulation. Yes. But I am, I am asking, why is that so since in the rapture, the dead in Christ would rise first? Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let me, let me um, explain that the patriarchs of old they did not receive the gospel as we did right the gospel was not available to them back there then they came out of a system of the law right they were under the law at the time and as a result of um their obedience to following or sticking to the law. They lived their time and they died. The scripture tells us that Moses, and you read it in Hebrews 11 or in Ephesians, that they look and they saw our day. They saw that Jesus Christ would have been born. He would have died. Um, he would have brought salvation, salvation that they were not privy to. 
right? So they were not um, beneficiaries of salvation as we in the day of grace, right? They were living a different dispensation, right? So those who are from that dispensation, their bodies would be resurrected after the tribulation. It is those who are exposed to the gospel as in the day of grace. Those are the ones that will come out of great tribulation. Moses and these men did not go through tribulation. They did not go through the great tribulation um, period. Right? So that is why they will, they, will, they will be resurrected after the tribulation period. So I don't know if um, that, that you served out for you to understand um, why they are not included in the tribulation scenes. Make sense, Mr. Lovato? Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. 